The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only <clears throat> mode. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. You've logged on to the Nelson Labs webinar, Filter Sterilization Validations. We will be joined by Nelson Labs uh, Filter Sterilization Validation Study Director, Nate Frederick. So, so a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you miss one of our webinars or would simply like to refer back to this one or any others, you can always find them on the Nelson Labs website under the On Demand Webinars page listed under Education. You can receive notifications of upcoming live and on demand webinars by liking Nelson Labs on Facebook or following us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Nelson Labs is a leading global provider of laboratory testing and expert advisory services for medtech and pharmaceutical companies. The company performs over 800 rigorous microbiological and analytical laboratory tests across the medical device, pharmaceutical, and protective barrier industries. The experts at Nelson know that every test matters and requires solutions to complex problems to improve patient outcomes and minimize client risk. Well, let's get started. Um, as I mentioned today, we're joined by Nate Frederick, Filter Sterilization Validation Study Director. Nate is a study director in the Antimicrobial Infiltration Department, where he oversees the filter sterilization validations as well as some container closure integrity tests. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry and Biology, and he's currently working on a Master's of Science in Toxicology. So now to, to begin today's presentation, I'd like to turn the time over to Nate. Oh, thanks for that introduction, Mike. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nate Frederick, as mentioned, and I am the study director overseeing filter sterilization validation studies and some filter development tests. I would like to thank you all in advance for attending this webinar, and I hope you all learned something about filter sterilization validations. To start with, uh, we're, we'll touch on a brief history. History suggests that water treatment dates back over 4,000 years. This wasn't when the first filter was invented, but however, when ancient civilizations boiled and strained water in attempts to purify it. The first water filter was actually developed around 500 BC when the father of medicine himself, Hippocrates, made something called a Hipp Hippocratic sleeve. This was essentially a cloth bag that water was poured through and would catch and filter anything that may cause a bad taste or smell. So this did not work on a microscopic level. This cloth bag was a long way from being a steriliz sterilization grade filter, but it laid some basic groundwork for filter development. Then came along sand and gravel filtration, where water was poured on and made its way through the sand and gravel. This removed some bacteria, but not the smallest, and it was still a long way from sterilization grade. The first instance of a sterilization membrane filter came from Richard Zimondi. He was working on proving the heterogeneous nature of colloidal solutions when he stumbled upon being able to separate colloidals using membrane filters. Now, there's also some history on the aseptic processing. In 1913, there was the first aseptic fill in Denmark for milk. In the 1920s, large-scale pharmaceutical production of blood and plasma was taking place. During the 1980s, Health Industry Manufacturers Association was formed, and the FDA published aseptic processing guidelines, which did include filter sterilization. In 1999, the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineering published sterile facilities as part of their guidelines. In current days, we test off of the uh, PDA Technical Report 26, AMI ISO 13408, and FDA guidance documents. To begin with sterilization filtration, the PDA Technical Report 26 describes sterilizing filtration as the process of removing microorganisms, not viruses, from a fluid stream without adversely affecting product quality. Various filters are used for a variety of filtrations, pharmaceuticals, material development, beverages, and water. A sterilization grade filter removes organisms rather than destroying them, for instance, autoclave due to heat. This is the last step in the manufacturing process. 
these filters are rated at 0.2 or 0.22 micron filters. This is an industry standard for sterilization grade filters. This size refers to the pore size in the filter. The small, tiny holes in the matrix of filters where liquid can get through, yet trapping bacteria. A sterilizing grade filter has tested to withhold 1 million colonies of organism per surface area. These filters work by allowing the product to go through yet trapping bacteria and not allowing it through the pores or the openings in the filter matrix. The filter matrix in this picture is the gray area. A filter can be used alone or with multiple filters in series, one after another. Having multiple filters in series can increase filtration and throughput. Filters come in all shapes and sizes and are made of a variety of material. There are capsule filters, which come in a housing already, cartridge filters, which will need a housing, and most of the time these fit in a stainless steel housing. There are smaller IV filters, and then syringe filters that fit on the end of a syringe. These filters are used for a variety of filtration, either for sterilizing liquids or removing or reducing bio burden. Each filter membrane could also be made up of a different material. For example, the most common types are PVDF, PES, and nylon. Each has its own benefit for the solution being filtered. Each different membrane, like I said, has its own unique application. PVDF have a very low protein binding and are relatively heat resistant. This allows filtrations to be ran at an increased temperature. PES are low protein and various chemical tolerance, which makes it great for pharmaceutical filtration. Nylon filters are good for more, most organic solvents. From the various types of filters, there can also be different sizes. Capsules and cartridge filters have an EFA, or effective filtration area, that can range from a couple hundred centimeters squared to as large as 24,000 centimeters squared for some of the 40-inch cartridges. There are also scaled-down disc filters. These are essentially the same filters, they just are smaller cutouts of the same exact membrane. These work in the same way, but they cannot handle as much throughput as the larger filters. And these filters are required you can also scale down capsule filters going from around 4,000 EFA to 300 EFA. Anything smaller than what you would normally use in production would be classified as scaled down. Due to the laboratory setting, 47 millimeter discs make scaling down and performing tests slightly easier. Filters may sterilize liquid, but the filters themselves need to be sterile. Before a filter uh, can be used, there are different options to make sure that they are sterile. Based on the membrane type, we can have a couple of different options. Gamma sterilization, EO sterilization, various autoclave cycles, and steam in place. However, these sterilizations could have adverse effects on the filter. A too high of temperature can hurt the filter, and it will be unable to filter out organisms. Most filters come pre-sterilized by the manufacturers, and if they don't, many manufacturers include the sterilization parameters with the filter. To see if a filter holds up during sterilization, we will test the filter by means of an integrity test, which I will touch on here shortly. Here are two examples of filters that have been altered by sterilization. The first picture is of a filter that went through a gamma sterilization. Here, that sterilization cycle made the downstream stem of the filter brittle enough to break. Next, we have a filter that went through repeat use sterilization from steam in place. Since the first filter broke on the downstream side of the filter housing, it still can sterile filter liquid, but the collection of the liquid itself may not be aseptic. The re repeated use filter looks at how a filter reacts to being sterilizing over and over and over again. <coughs> Now, before I get any further, I will be talking about two different levels of testing for various filters. For the sake of this presentation, we will be using level one and level two as an example. Level one filters are usually for filter manufacturers. Here, this is where the filters are de developed. At level two, this is the use and application of the filters. For example, a certain company may make and develop a filter, 
level one. That same filter that was developed can be used by a pharmaceutical company to sterile filter a new drug or drug component, level two. They, plan it, they play hand in hand and follow some of the same steps, but the applications of the tests are different. Integrity testing is a key aspect use of the filters. Uh, this is a test that allows us to see if a filter is integral. There are three main types of methods to test this. There is bubble point integrity testing, diffusive flow testing, and a pressure hold test. For this presentation, I'm just going to be touching on a bubble point value test. Here, we make sure a filter can meet certain pressure values while reading the downstream value of various air coming through the filter. For those pores I was talking about earlier, the 0 0.22, 0 0.2 uh, size pores, they have to be soaked with some sort of liquid. This liquid could vary from water to 70-30 IPA or a different ratio of a lower surface tension fluid. Once the filter is soaked under pressure, we then evacuate it from the filter and attach a flow meter downstream and read the airflow at various pressures. A filter is considered integral if it reaches the value for the wetting fluid. If there's a free flow of air coming out of the filter before this value in pressure is reached, it is considered not integral. This test is, is called a bubble point test because when this method was developed and is still widely used today, the air coming out of the filter was held underwater and they knew they would reach the free flow air point as soon as there was a steady stream of bubbles coming out of the water. This is a non-destructive test, meaning we can integrity test a filter over and over again with no adverse effects. Here, we can see an increase in pressure being applied to a filter. The airflow or diffusive flow is minimal, but going up ever so slightly until the bubble point. At the bubble point, this is where the free flow of air starts to go through the filter. The pressure value that the air starts to go through is the bubble point value of the filter being tested. If this value is lower than the specified value, the filter is not integral and has a chance of organism passing through. If a lower surface tension wetting fluid was used to wet the pores, we might see a bubble point value of around 20 rather than 80, thus lowering the value. Whichever fluid was used to wet the filters will change the bubble point value, but the known bubble point values for filters is only a handful of wetting agents. Most filters have values for water and a mix of IPA with water. We'll, we'll be mentioning integrity testing throughout this webinar. Another level one test is uh, bacterial retention. Uh, ASTM standard F838 is a standard that measures the effectiveness and ability to filter a challenge solution. This is referred to as bacterial retention testing. The end result of this test is to essentially have a filter that is ready to move up to the application. And that filter must be able to sterilely filter a set amount of bacteria. Once a filter passes this test, meeting the methodology, it can then be considered a sterilization grade filter and in turn will be used in the final sterilization steps of liquid. The bacteria used in testing is B. diaminuta. This is the industry standard organism, which is a gram negative bacilli. The organism used, this organism is used specifically because of its size. It is 0.4 micron by 1.2 micron, approximately. Uh, the amount of organism that these filters are challenged with is greater or equal to 1 times 10 to the 7th colony forming units per effective filtration area. The bigger the filter, the more total volume of organism we'll need for the challenge. The challenge organism must be filtered at 30 PSIG, and in turn, it is time to see how long it takes to go through the filter. The organism has to be the correct size, and this is showed by pushing the organism through a control membrane. This membrane is a known pore size of a filter, which will allow passage of this organism, and then showing that this organism is viable to grow. If the organism grew up too large, it will not be able to pass through this control membrane. And then if the filter requires a different wetting fluid rather than water for the integrity test, we have to rinse the filter, collect and inoculate the rinse to show that there is no inhibitory factors left behind. After the liquid is pushed through the filter, it is then collected in a vessel. This whole test takes place in a closed system and follows aseptic processes. From that vessel, 
we membrane filter the filtrate in its entirety. This could be filtering 12 liters of solution through a manifold. We then incubate the membranes for at least seven days and then observe growth, if any. For the filter to be successful, it will have to retain every organism. There could be no growth on any of the plates. This testing follows ASTM F838. Now, there are other tests that may be used for level one testing, but at the moment, this is all we offer at Nelson Labs. So let's get into our level two testing, our validation work. There are four main types of validation studies, compatibility, bacterial retention, extractables and leachables, and a bubble point integrity test value. Earlier, we looked at filters themselves. Now, all four of these tests look at how a certain drug product has an effect on the filter. These tests follow the PDA technical report number 26. Since we are now into the validation side, there are appropriate laws and guidance rather than just ASTM F838. The GMPs we have to follow, specifically 21 CFR 211.113, which states appropriate written procedures designed to prevent microbiological contamination of drug product purporting to be sterile shall be established and followed. Such procedures shall be included in validation of any sterilization process. This is essentially the groundwork for filter sterilization validations. And then for regulatory guidance, there is the FDA sterile drug products produced by aseptic processing, as well as the technical standard ISO 13408-2, aseptic processing of healthcare products, filtration, as well as PDA Technical Report 26, sterilizing filtration of liquids. While the last test described was a level one test, the bacterial retention, this is its level two test, filter sterilization bacterial retention. It follows many of the same aspects. Here, this testing makes sure a filter can adequately filter a drug product while removing any organisms that may be present. This ensures that the filtry at the end will be sterile. Here, for our bacterial retention validation, the natural bio burden of the solution shall be identified. Once it is identified, and if the solution doesn't contain any organism smaller than B. diminuta, we will once again use B. diminuta. There are some rare instances where B. diminuta can't be used if a smaller organism may be present. This will require a justification of another organism to be supplied. Once again, the challenge concentration is greater or equal to one times 10 to the seventh colony forming units per centimeter squared of effective filtration area. This organism must be properly prepared and diminutive in size. The filters are in contact with, drug or with the drugs or products but there's an added test here, and that test is on the product itself. There could be some bacterial bactericidal properties within the product, which may kill off the bacteria, resulting in a false positive. Based on the results of a viability test, it will determine how we actually challenge the filter with bacteria. We could be using an indirect or a two-step direct inoculation. A direct inoculation is where we directly add the organism to the product. An indirect inoculation is where we introduce the product to the filter, evacuate it, rinse extensively, and then add organism. In this retention, we have to follow some of the manufacturer's steps for production of their product. The temperature at what the batch is filtered at, the product filtration time. If a product is being sent through a sterilizing, sterilization grade filter and the batch takes a total of two hours to filter, we have to validate that filter for at least two hours. If we validate a filter for two hours and the batch takes two hours and 20 minutes to filter, after this validation was completed, that batch would have to be thrown out as it was not validated for two hours and 20 minutes. We also need to look at either the flow rate or the pressure of the product going through the filter. A higher flow rate or a higher pressure has a different impact on the filter and filter membrane. Here, we will mimic the flow rate for the allotted time. In the lab setting, only one of these can be manipulated at once, either the flow rate or the pressure, and we will justify accordingly. 
we also have to mimic the sterilization of the filters. Rather, this be as previously stated, autoclave cycle, gamma sterilization, EO sterilization, or steam in place. Once the product has been in contact with the filter for the set time, we then filter out the product and check for growth after an incubation time. Depending on the previously, previous findings uh, from if the product is actually static or not, the organism may be added at the beginning of that two hours, which will allow us to directly filter and collect from the filters. Or if we need to indirectly inoculate, we'll need to empty out the product. It's worth noting we add a control to see if we've rinsed it enough. If we have rinsed it enough, we then add an organism, the organism for two more hours and then collect it from the filter. Now the two hours was just the base time, uh, different validations run for different times. The filters used in this testing will also go through an integrity test. They will run the integrity test before the recirculation and after the recirculation. If the filter does not pass an integrity test to begin with, the said filter will not be used in testing. However, due to the nature of some products and components, certain filters may not be applicable with the drug product being filtered. This can cause the filter in use to swell or dissolve, which with a filter swelling or dissolving, it will allow any sort of contamination to get through, which will compromise the product. This is tested through a compatibility test. Here's a small example of a table to help companies choose which filter may be compatible with their products. As you can see by this table, if you have concentrated sulfuric, you will not be able to use a PVDF or PES membrane, as it is shown as incompatible. But based on this chart, you would use a PTFE membrane. While this is just a small amount of the possible acids, this chart goes into detail about the various esters, alcohols, and ketones that may be present in a solution which all of these should be taken into account when selecting a filter for your product. Many of these tables can be found online or provided straight from the manufacturers. This validation is similar to the bacterial retention, just without bacteria. The product is in contact with the filter for the validation time, following the set temperature, flow rate, and pressure, and undergoes the same sterilization parameters. After it has been in contact, there is an examination of the filter. We check the filter to see if any swelling or shredding happened or if it is discarded at all. Then there is an integrity test to see if the filter is still integral. If the filter passes integrity tests, the chemical compatibility passes and that filter is okay to use with the product. Our next test is our extractable study. Here, we add water into our system and uh, perform a baseline of the system. We perform the baseline using NVR, FTIR, GCMS, LCMS, or ICPMS. From that baseline, we are, we are able to proceed with the filter in place, adding the product or a surrogate. We then collect the surrogate or product after another hour of recirculation. We evaporate it down and analyze the same way to determine what was extracted off of the filter. One of the main points to look at here is how much non-volatile residue, NVR, is coming off of the filter. This is essentially particulate matter that was taking off of the filter due to the solution being filtered through it. Another aspect that could be analyzed is looking at the product itself. A surrogate solution may be needed when certain components have an impact on the testing or when the solutions themselves will contribute too much non-volatile residue to the testing, making the measurement of NVR unreadable. Earlier, when I was talking about integrity testing, different wetting fluids have different values on the membrane of the filter to be considered integral. A lower surface tension fluid usually lowers the value. When filtering drugs, this can decrease the bubble point value by an unknown amount. If the filter requires water for the test, then we must rinse out all the drug product out of the filter and then use water. However, if this validation is in place, there will be no need for rinsing. They can validate their filters with the product to get a specific unique value. Here, we will find integrity values 
of a specific number of filters with water or the correct wetting fluid, and then we'll do the same with the product. Here in this graph, we have the bubble point values for multiple filters. Once we have them for the proper wetting fluid, we will then use the same exact filters with the drug product to see how they change. We perform a ratio to examine and find that validated value, eliminating the need to rinse the filters before an integrity test. This saves time on the manufacturing end so they can go straight from sterile filtering their product right away and into, right into an integrity test, rather than rinsing the filter out countless times to remove the product from all the pores. If after the batch has been produced and the filter does not pass an integrity test, there is no way to know if that batch is sterile or not and must be thrown out. This test also provides some physical characteristics of the product, such as surface tension and viscosity values. <clears throat> While all these validations in place may be required and helpful, there's a lot of upfront work that goes into place. A good starting point would be a throughput study. This could be done in-house. When the filter, while the filter may be compatible and have no adverse effects, there could be some adverse effects to solutions containing a lot of proteins. There could be taking on a filter, thus resulting in the inability to filter. Over time, filtration may slow down, and due to this, there could be extended filtration time. Because of longer filtration times, there could be opportunity for organisms to pass through the filter by a phenomenon known as grow through. This is where for filtrations that take more than 24 hours, the organism has a chance to actually grow through the membrane itself. But here we have the four common types of blockage. Complete blockage, where a protein completely covers, a pup, covers up a pore of the filter. Due to this happening over and over again, it will lead to a cake formation. This will result in the stoppage of filtration. We also have intermediate blockage, where the pores aren't quite completely covered, and then there's our standard blockage, where the blockage is happening down in the pores, al uh, allowing for reduced filtration. As far as practical use goes, we can follow this as a guideline. A filter is developed, and then in use, we have to determine if the filter is compatible with, with what is being filtered. If it is compatible, we then have to see if it can filter out bacteria for that process time. There should be a limiting amount of NVR coming off of the filter into the product. After final filtration, an integrity test value specific to the product should be used. <clears throat> One of my main points I would also like to convey is don't wait to validate. If at any point during the manufacturer decides to use a higher pressure or flow rate, or even a longer filtration time, a new validation will be needed in order to reflect these parameters. We have had instances where we run validations and right as the product was about to be released for clinical trials, it failed the compatibility, meaning that it was deteriorating the filter and the filter essentially wasn't filtering the drug product, it was just acting as a tube, allowing the product to go through. This could have been avoided if the compatibility was done sooner. <clears throat> While I just gave a brief overview of the testing, it should be noted that I left out some regulatory regulations just for the sake of this presentation. For our level two testing, we completely comply with PDA Technical Report 26, as well as, as, well as FDA guidance documents. Nelson's product is the final report for all these tests, and we make sure that they comply with the various regulatory bodies. While all these tests are performed on a regular basis, we are also very flexible for a lot of R&D work regarding filters. I can work with each and one of you individually to create protocols for various testing needs. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I will be happy to answer them. And for further inquiries about testing, do not hesitate to send me an email. Nelson Labs is a part of Sotera Health. Here are our sister companies where further education and testing could be found. Thank you all once again for attending this webinar. Great. Thank you, Nate, for your insights. And we've all learned some great information today, and we've given us a lot to think about. Um, we do have some questions that came in while you spoke, and we'd like to address them now. And if any of you uh, audience members have additional questions, 
Go ahead and feel free to enter them into the questions button on your on your dashboard and we will get to as many as we possibly can. <clears throat> so, okay, here's the first question that we have, Nate. Why are 0.22 or 0.2 micron pore size cons considered uh, as sterile filters? That's a great question. Um, most organisms will be captured by 0.22 or 0.2 micron filters. Uh, there are, mycoplasma will not be captured by this, resulting in the need for a 0.1 micron filter. Now, the 0.1 micron filters are a little too fine. Um, they will allow product to go through, but just not as well because the pore size is extremely small. Um, which is why in the bacterial retention validation, we want to sample the bio burden known in the solution to make sure that there is nothing smaller than B. diminuta. Um, B. diminuta is used as the industry standard just because of its size. It is a smaller organism, um, but there may be the chance for the mycoplasma. And I believe that's one of the only smaller organisms uh, or bio burden that will be found. Okay, thanks, Nate. Here's our next question. How do you grow up the organism? Yeah, that, that's a, another great question. Um, it takes us a couple days. I'm not too sure how much uh, I could give away. I don't want to give away too much of our SDPs. Um, we essentially transfer the organism from a slant and grow it up. And then once it has grown up on a plate, we then transfer the plate into a broth. And then we make another transfer from that broth into another solution and incubate it for a set amount of time. Um, this has proven to meet the ASTM F838 as well as uh, the PDA technical report. 26 um, for organism selection. Okay, thank you, Nate. Here's our next question. Are there filters with a smaller pore size? Yes, so there is, as I mentioned in the uh, two questions ago, there are 0 0.1 uh, micron pore size filters, um, mainly used for filtering out mycoplasma. Okay, here's our next question. How often do you perform an integrity test? An integrity test uh, could be performed right after the filter is manufactured, just ensuring that that lot manufactured meets the integrity test specifications. Um, we like to run an integrity test after a filter has gone through the sterilization cycle, just to make sure that there were no adverse effects from the filter being sterilized. Uh, so it's kind of pre-use, post-sterilization integrity testing. And then there will always be a integrity test performed after the product has been filtered and this integrity test just makes sure that the filter uh, stayed intact throughout filtration perfect okay, we have another question here how do companies make claims about bigger pore sizes for example 0 0.45 0 0.65 and point Yeah, so companies can make play, claims for uh, larger pore sizes. Um, for bacterial retention testing, you could use a larger organism. Uh, I believe for 0.45 filters, they use serratia, uh, serratia marcescens. Um, and if the filter is able to withstand serratia, then it gets a 0.45 micron rating. Um, I'm unfamiliar with the larger pore sizes. Um, I'm not too sure if E. coli may be used or if they use particles that may, may know the particle size and push those through the filter and then they analyze it using particulate matter. Thank you. On to the next one here. 
how is the stability of filter established? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the stability of filters established is more on the manufacturing side. Um, they'll look at the different matrix of the membrane, uh, the, the different chemistry makeup, and also pair that with the, the housings. Um, so there's various different housings that can be used, which will help with stability, as well as the different, uh, essentially hookups. Um, there could be a hose barb or there could be a sanitary fitting on the dip, uh, the filters, which will allow for different stability. Okay, we have another question here. What organism is used to validate a 0.1 UM cartridge? I, I believe it's mycoplasma. I'm not too familiar with that as we don't uh, validate 0.1s here at Nelson. Great. Thanks, Nate. Well, that's looks like we're getting close to the time that uh, prepared for this. I'd like to thank all of you um, for attending this webinar. And I'd like to thank Nate for that thorough and informative presentation um, and for his great insights. I'd like to thank you, the viewer, for attending this session. We hope you found that it was a valuable experience. Uh, you'll be able to find the recording of this session on the Nelson Labs website under the on-demand webinar section in a few days. We thank you for attending. We hope you have a great rest of your day.